Hello, welcome everyone to Virtual Small Set. Um, this is the workshop session, Advanced Concepts 2. Um, we're going to take a little bit of time and do a little bit of a slow start over here because it takes a little bit of time for participants to come into the room. But my name is Carrie Cahoy. I'm on the Small Satellite Committee and I'm excited to be here um, virtually with you guys. We wish we were in Logan, Utah, enjoying some of the Aggie ice cream and going for hikes and um, everything else and, you know, getting to know each other standing in the food lines, <laughs> which are always awesome food. Um, but we'll get back there next year. And meanwhile, we're excited to be able to hear live from um, some of our presenters who've had on-demand content available on the web page. There's also the online proceedings that have their papers. This is all linked in the menu. So if you'd like to see their papers as we start to ask the questions, you can do that there. This session is going to be uh, moderated um, by Dr. Alex Howard. So hi, Alex. Um, he is the Director of Space Systems and Technology at Raytheon BBN Technologies in Cambridge, Massachusetts, focusing on low TRL capabilities and advanced technology. He was previously with Air Force Research Laboratory Space Vehicles Director as the mission lead for space control and the chief scientist for the Eagle satellite mission. So welcome, Alex. I'm going to hand it over to you for running the show. I'll be here as backup and looking forward to hearing from everyone. Thanks so much for being online. Great. Thank you, Carrie. I, I want to echo that. Uh, welcome to everybody. It's great to be here, uh, at least virtually. And again, we'll we'll be there in person, hopefully next year, uh, if not sooner. So definitely, um, I see folks coming in here. And uh, what we'd like to do is, uh, you know, briefly, as Carrie mentioned, the papers and the talks are indeed on the SmallSat website. I encourage you to go read and watch those if you have not yet. And um, if you have any problems finding a link, uh, just shoot us a message in the, the chat and we'll see if we can help you out there. Now at the bottom of the screen also, I'd like to remind everyone there is the, the button for the question and answer. So if you have questions you'd like to ask the, any of the speakers, just put it in there and uh, we'll see what we can do. And uh, it's worked out pretty well. So I definitely wanna encourage folks to ask your questions. Uh, if that's not working for you or it's easier to put it in the chat, feel free to put your question in the chat and uh, Carrie or myself can uh, see that and everyone and we can address it there. So uh, with that, um, I would like to, you know, welcome all the speakers and um, what we'll do is we'll go through and have the speakers, you know, give a brief overview of their talk. And uh, so what we'll do is we'll start right at the beginning here. Um, our first speaker is Martina Lofquist and uh, her talk was entitled Accelerating Deep Learning Applications in Space. So uh, Martina, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. So my name is Martina and uh, I'm a solutions architect at Momentus and I've also conducted research recently together with Jose Cano at the University of Glasgow on ways to accelerate deep learning applications in space. So the motivation for this research is that the decreased cost in accessing space has led to an increasing amount of uh, data capture and we're talking about terabytes of data being downlinked each day. So this is a really expensive process and not all of that data is useful. And therefore processing the data on the satellite directly uh, will provide huge opportunities. So I was looking into ways to um, compress images using both uh, image scaling technique as well as uh, lossless compression technique on, uh, and testing this on a constrained device. So specifically NVIDIA Jetson Nano um, and uh, previous research that uh, have been conducted in this area and on low power GPUs often look into ways to optimize the network itself. And there has been some, although very little research on transforming the image itself to make them run faster without losing much accuracy. Um, there are quite a few techniques for manipulating the images and this has been quite well researched. And there's also an orbital edge a computing system that has been developed for implementing real-time processing in orbit, in orbit. However, putting these three, so uh, putting together the uh, on-orbit processing, so processing at the edge and using a constrained device as well as compressing the images, putting these three together hasn't really been researched before, so that's why um, we decided to focus on this research. And what we did was to use a single shot detector and a region-based fully convolutional network for um, detecting objects in the images. And the uh, results of this, we were looking into the speed, memory consumption, as well as accuracy. First of all, the full data set wasn't able to run on the constrained device. And we tested this on a cluster for a baseline. 
So um, first step was to get it to run 100% and we achieved that as well as improving the speed and uh, the memory consumption and uh, comparing the different techniques we, we saw that um, the lossless compression technique lost the least accuracy but it didn't improve as well in inference time and uh, in memory consumption. So I think that that is all for now for the introduction. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Martina. You know, uh, I have to say, so if I read your paper correctly, you, uh, I understand you used pre-trained uh, systems, right? So you didn't have to develop the algorithm or, or use an algorithm to train it and so forth. What, what would that mean to have your own that you, what would the, be entailed in the system to train the system to do that, to understand how to hybrid with the lossless versus compression and to get the best result? Or is it, so could is that could you repeat the, the last part? So you were saying, yeah, I, I was using the pre-trained um, algorithm, uh -huh. so single shot detector and RFCN is the other one called. Um, and uh, sorry, could you repeat what the question was? Sure. So if you were going to develop your own algorithm and train mm -hmm. uh, to train it, uh, what would be involved? And do you think that you could uh, pull out higher efficiencies or, or better information? Doing that. Yeah, so so definitely the network itself could be optimized. Um, but I didn't want to focus my my research on the network itself. I wanted to focus more on the constrained device as well as compression techniques because I think it's more more interesting to look into different ways of compressing uh, the images themselves, so that you can then apply different types of um, pre-trained networks or object detectors for them. Um, there's a few, there's a few other uh, pre-trained networks that I looked into and started evaluating, but uh, because of lack of time, I unfortunately didn't didn't complete those. Um, what I what I would look into though as uh, further research would be to optimize the network itself. So there are ways of uh, making the network run the images faster. Um, so that would be that would be one way to do it. Um, although I haven't conducted that research yet, so that would be for future work. I hope that answers the question. I think that's very interesting. Yes. And right now, is there an application in mind or is it more, how do I get all the information that these disparate satellites are taking and reduce that and provide usefulness? Yeah. So there's a lot of applications uh, in mind for, for applying on orbit processing. And uh, if you, if you, for anyone who's uh, interested in reading the paper, if you look into the background, I, I give a few examples there. And some perfect examples are, for example, um, there's a lot of images that are taken taken of the ocean, trying to detect ships. So uh, you might only want the images that uh, the photos that uh, are of ships or contain ships. So instead of downlinking all of that data, so then if you can get rid of all of the say 80% of images that contain just water, and um, that is a perfect application for this. But then the the whole the whole concept or whole motivation for this was, was in particular on orbit processing for going further away from, from Earth. So not just staying in, in satellites. I mean, that is the main application and that's where it's going to be used first. Um, as, as I can see from some other companies developing GPUs that are space ready and such, but being able to, to use this kind of processing say on rovers on Mars. Um, and I know there's some development going on with that as well. And that's going to be highly useful as well as further away into into deep space. Um, so, so there's plenty of applications for it. And uh, one thing to keep in mind then, which I realized in my research as well, is that not all um, satellites or com companies that operate the satellites are interested in downlinking only a certain amount of data. A lot of a lot of companies also want to get all the raw data. But I think as as we downlink more and more data, I mean, there's ter terabytes of data being downlinked each day and that's just gonna increase. We're gonna have to find a way to, um, to filter through it and on orbit is more, more cost effective. No, that's, that's great, I, exactly. Do you, do you foresee the use of mesh networking or grid computing in space to offload that computing on the idle GPUs and kind of, uh, you know, uh, multi-node computing, so to speak, uh, or even off, you know, offloading into the internet and you know, do leverage all the computing resources possible? Or do you envision keeping it singular? Um, so there's also been research on networks of satellites communicating and, and storing data in different places. And I definitely think there are opportunities for that as well. Um, 
my, my main focus was just to find ways to, to accelerate these kind of deep learning applications in space. And I particularly wanted to look into the constrained devices that can be used. So I only looked into NVIDIA Jetson Nano, but there are other constrained devices out there and, and larger ones as well for larger satellites. But this is a perfect size for, for testing it out on a CubeSat. And I know there, there are a few companies that are testing this out as well as universities that are planning on sending it up to space, in, including the university that I went to. Um, I, I think the, the first step is, is to test just a GPU up in space in a 3U CubeSat and uh, then doing some kind of image compression because that is the, the easiest way to, to test it out. Uh, it can be a bit risky if, you, if you're actually trying to do certain um, detection already up in space because it's not as reliable some some networks are, are not as reliable as just compressing it using the gpus um but then the next step would be to look into how to distribute this across multiple satellites and and using a network of them and then space robotics is the next step after that and there's plenty of exciting things that that can be developed um from this so i i really encourage people to look into this particular area of study and further the research that that i started on that's great. Thank you, Martina. Uh, to keep uh, the discussion going here, I, I think one of the questions came up in, in the chat, a uh, brief agenda of what we're going through today. We'll give each speaker an opportunity to go through and talk about the paper a little bit, and then uh, we'll open it up for further discussion and questions. So uh, with that, Martina, thank you so much. And um, we'll move uh, to the next speaker in the session, um, Zaria Zerfanton. Um, I probably totally messed up the last name, I apologize. Uh, Drag Augmentation Systems for Space Debris Mitigation. And uh, so Zaria, would you, uh, welcome. Yeah, hello. Thanks Alex for the introduction. That was, that was a pretty good attempt at my surname. It is quite strange. <laughs> um, my name is Zaria and I'm here representing Cranfield University today. Um, so as we said, I'm doing drag augmentation devices. So at Cranfield, we're currently developing a family of drag augmentation systems to help deorbit small satellites from low Earth orbit. So as we've heard kind of over and over again at this conference, the, the small satellite in industry is increasing at a rapid rate, and that's great. It, it allows a lot more opportunities for people who couldn't access space before to access space. But unfortunately, that also means that the issue that we have with space debris is growing. Um, so we want to make it as easy as possible for um, small satellites, especially those without on, on board propulsion, to deorbit and keep within the space guide mit mitigation guidelines. Um, so at Cranfield, we've currently developed um, two different systems. So we have three of the sails in orbit and two of them actually opened at the end of 2018 and the start of 2019. So that kind of gave us a unique opportunity to track their development and to see what the impact of the, the sales on the satellite would be. Um, so we did a quick study with, um, with Belstead Research Limited over in the UK, and we determined what we thought the dynamics of the, um, the both the short term and the long term dynamics of the, the sale is post deployment. Um, so now we're, we're moving on. We're, we're working on the third iteration of our design. So that's kind of the focus of my studies. Um, so we're looking to make it a bit more adaptable. So we're kind of taking apart the previous designs and making a more modular approach going forward. So that means that you wouldn't need a full side panel to be free of obstructions, which is very rare. <laughs> Um, you can kind of just place bits and pieces of sail on different parts of your satellite and then deploy them um, in succession of one another. Um, so that's kind of the new idea that we're working with, just to try and make it as easy as possible for people to integrate this into our system. Um, so one of two of the main things that we're looking at there is, again, we're, we're using kind of the heritage that we have in flight. We're using the data that we're getting back from our sail already to try and improve our design. And we're also looking at the long-term degradation of the sail in the Earth orbit because um, we need to be able to qualify these sales for 25 years lifetime, <laughs> which is a very long time. And um, a lot of sale materials don't really like that. Um, so, so that's kind of a main topic that we're looking at at the moment. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much us in brief. That's, that's awesome. And I appreciated the, the amazing image you had of the sale deploying in your presentation. Pretty amazing. So I guess touching on the qualification, what is, have you looked at what it would take, you know, as you're packing these and what's the lifetime through thermal cycle, vibration and so forth. And what, what happens if, and you know, you have the Icarus that deploys those entire system, but what in the 
hybrid system, what if one or more does not deploy? Have you, uh, what is all that, what would that mean? Yeah, so no, that's a really good point. Um, one of the things that we've noticed when we're looking at sales is reliability is really important. Um, because especially the, re the reliability of the satellite as well, because it's one of the last things that you're going to do to deploy the sale. So you want to make sure that it actually deploys. Um, and also, you want to make sure that it's not heavily dependent on other sy subsystems. Um, so that by the end of life, you know, those are degraded and can't deploy. Um, so we put a lot of effort into that. Um, as to the other kind of things, um, so we're working with Belstead Research Limited at the moment to kind of to come up with a toolkit where you can model your sale deployment um, in um, in a model, and then that shows you what effect that has on your orbit time. So what we want to eventually be able to do is to safely deploy some of the sales in a normal attitude in parallel to your direction of travel so that it has minimal uh, impact on drag um, but kind of deploy them one at a time so that if everything was to go catastrophically wrong the satellite would start to tumble um, and it would still do orbit within time great and how how did you come up on the sail concept sorry i didn't i mean versus a balloon or another geometry you know was there what was the trade study and, and you know the the thought process there yeah um so i think i think it was basically at the start it was kind of active versus um passive deployment devices so we wanted something that is really low impact on the satellite and um, so that's why we decided to go for something passive for the sale itself um we decided to go for a sale because you can have stowed energy in the um in the booms so it means that for deployment, we don't need a motor, we don't need inflatable gases, we don't have to worry about something leaking. Um, all you need is just the capstone cutter to cut a Kevlar cord that holds the device in place, and then the satellite deploys. Um, so I think probably the main thing that drove us was having something that's really, really simple, so that in the end it could be really low cost, but also so that it doesn't um, affect the operation of the satellite too much. It would be really fun, Zarya, to have a movie of deployments on orbit, but that would probably add complexity to the system. But maybe for a demonstration um, for the first attempts, that would be captured. Definitely. <laughs> we would love to have that. Um, unfortunately, yeah, up until now, the, the satellites have been actual like working satellites that the, the sails have been deployed on so it means that they have to passivate their system um, before deploying the sail which which means that we can't get anything back so we're very happy to actually get the photo of our deployed sail um, but definitely uh, we're going to be approaching um, the UK Space Agency and um, Satellite Application Protocol to possibly do it in, in the orbit demonstration mission so with that we hope to be able to put a camera on to see what's actually happening up there. That would be that would be very awesome. Uh, have you thought about deploying the cells during the mission? You know, uh, for applications such as solar sailing to raise the charge the orbit or anything, uh, a different purpose than drag. Conjunction avoidance. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, that, that is something that we're looking at. Um, for the moment, obviously, it's, it's focused on deorbiting, um, but we're also looking at things like um, you don't you don't really have a choice when you're a small satellite and you're on a shared launch to what orbit you're going to. And sometimes your orbit can change very last minute. Um, so we are looking at things like potentially using it to change orbit or for collision avoidance. Um, it, it's going to be a little bit more difficult just because our, our system can't be retracted. Um, so, you know, once it's deployed, it's deployed, <laughs> it's out there. Um, but with the system that we have with the multiple smaller sails, that might be something to look into. Awesome. That's great. And one, one last question for right now is, uh, what would you say the biggest difference is between your approach and some of the others that are out there with, with similar designs? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think, um, I think what's kind of important here is, yes, there's other designs out there. There's a lot of competition. Um, everybody wants to be the first to commercialize kind of their product. Um, but I think the variety of small satellites that we have is so large that the variety of the orbit devices that we should that we have should kind of match that. Um, because every satellite is going to have different requirements. Every satellite is going to want different things from their orbit device. Um, so I think R1, where it's unique, is um, with the new design, it's going to be a lot more applicable to any kind of satellite. So you don't have to think about it at the initial design. You can kind of think about it later on. And just the fact that it only requires a few milliseconds of power to deploy. Um, so it's, it's not, it's, 
it, it still ensures that you're going to deploy even if you're having issues with your power system after you know years of lifetime. That is definitely a good thing. Well, thank you, Zari. I appreciate that. Uh, we we'll now move to our, our third speaker, uh, Lucas Anderson uh, from Utah State University, uh, Active Thermal Architecture Design and, st and Status. Lucas, Hi. welcome. Hi, everybody. Yeah, so we're out here with Utah State University in the Center for Space Engineering, and uh, we're also partnered up with uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and um, we work on uh, small satellite technology uh, partnership grants through NASA. So um, this project is the Active Thermal Architecture, which is essentially a um, 1U active thermal control subsystem for CubeSat platforms. Really, we're looking at 6U and above. Um, but basically what it is at its heart is it's uh, liquid cooling, it's single phase liquid cooling with a deployable tracking radiator. And um, it's, a two, it's a two stage, so it also integrates a miniature tactical crackler. I actually have a, one of our prototypes right here. You can kind of see, you know, deployable radiator kind of thing. So what we do is um, the crackler attached, you know, this whole thing will go up in a, lot, in a stowed position and then deploy. Uh, and on board, we have a little stepper micro motor that can track the sun. You can track deep space. You can keep yourself um, either edge on the sun for, for optimal cooling, or you can even kind of uh, turn a little face into the sun for an additional um, control and feedback for your thermal. Um, like I said, this is active thermal control. So we're looking to not only provide stable ambient environments for CubeSats, but we're also looking to reject uh, quite a bit of power. This is a second. Um, uh, a second time we studied this, so we've had a previous project called the Active Craft CubeSat, where we were able to reject over 100 watts from a 6U CubeSat um, while maintaining um, an, an environment that was uh, that was comfortable for a miniature crowd cooler. Um, for this particular project, this was kind of the prototype build of that previous project. So we wanted to design um, the full system. We wanted to put it into an actual CubeSat chassis that we built. We designed here. We wanted to develop all of the uh, the fluid paths. You know, this is going to be a, a deployable radius, so we need to develop um, fluid, uh, fluid uh, joints and fluid rotary joints to uh, two stage deployment and tracking. We also um, we use a lot of additive manufacturing, so both 3D printing, kind of traditional DMLS, but we also use a lot of what's called ultrasonic additive manufacturing to embed our fluid channels directly into the CubeSat chassis. And what that lets us do is simplify and miniaturize everything. So rather than having a bunch of fluid paths and everything, everything is just right into the uh, chassis walls. And um, because this is another aspect of this is because this is an active system, uh, we wanted to make sure that they need to, any vibrations that were generated by the crowd cooler, which is, is generally a very large problem, um, were mitigated. And anything that was uh, generated by our micro pump was also mitigated before it hit the CubeSat. So we've included um, wire rope standoffs, which you can see on this little, uh, prototype here, you know, wire rope standoffs. Ooh, where am I over here? On the bottom, we also have um, poly, uh, poly, ooh, sorry, polylytic graphene sheet thermal links, particle dampers. We have a variety of um, vibration damping technologies that we've integrated in here to, um, to really cut down on uh, any exported vibe in the system. But yeah, so ultimately what we're looking to do here is, is um, this is kind of demonstrating uh, the use of a crowd cooler and providing the ambient environment for that. But this system can generally do any type of thermal management, uh, maintain environments, uh, it's got feedback control, and it also demonstrates just um, single phase, two stage mechanical pump fluid loops for CubeSats. So yeah, that's kind of where, where, where we're at right now. and We're just at the testing phase, so. That, that's great, thanks Lucas. If I recall in the paper, you talk about uh, 60 watt capacity of that uh, cooler, and yeah. how scalable? Is this system and that uh, for you know how small of a small sat and how you know how large could you envision how large this going? Could go? yeah. So the original project had a six U um, a six U radiator, so it was the, it was basically you know the full size if you were um, using a deployment uh, envelope for um, you know like a solar panel, you you said swapped out that for a radiator. Um, that right there could go up to over 100 watts. This one's a four U, so it's it's a little bit smaller. And that one we're 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 kind of capping it. Um, 60 watts because we can maintain a very comfortable environment for our crowd cooler at that point. In terms of scalability, um, it is quite scalable depending on how you control the system. Um, basically, what you go, your the way you know with with a, a single phase fluid loop like this is your coldest spot is going to be your radiator. So whatever side radiator you have, its view factor, its emissivity values are going to kind of set your baseline, and then you can throttle your pump up and down and move your um, the 
rest of your, your uh, fluid loop, the rest of your system closer to that, um, closer or further away from that system. So you can go from a laminar to a turbulent. So um, I would say, depending on how you're, what you're doing, it's, it's fairly um, tunable. Um, I don't have a number off the top of my head, um, but, but yeah, but you can do, but this has a lot of different active systems you can kind of control to, to tune in your temperatures. That, that's awesome. What, with those systems, for example, you talk about the vibration and, and you know, how, how are the vibrations in that jitter effect? How, you know, how are they controlled and characterized through the pyro, you know, that graphite thermal strap that you yeah. talk about? So how effective is it? Is, that's actually what we're taking care of this week, actually today even. So we're working with um, Kistler uh, with force dynamometers, accelerometers, and force transducers. And what we're doing is we're characterizing the exported vibration with expect, exported force or acceleration of each active component. And then what you can do is, is that, um, so the, the main body is gonna shake from the, uh, the crowd cooler and the pump, but by using, um, what you really care about is the relative vibration of your optical instrument. Let's say you're using like an electro-optical instrument, you're gonna get that jitter and blur in your image. Um, so what we're doing basically is we, we, do all the, we do all the measuring here, and we we're taking care of that this week. We have ANSYS models for our vibration transfer and what effect that has. And then in our actual uh, thermal vacuum prototype, we also have um, sensors that basically sit right on a, a kind of a dummy optical detector. And what we do is we show that from each stage as each, each port of um, you know, transfer function of export, exported vibration uh, gets mitigated down to where we don't have any, we, we have an we have um, acceptable level, level of jitter at the, uh, the tip. And what we're really kind of characterizing that is, is less than half a pixel in any lateral direction near and around the frequencies of the camera is what we're kind of looking at. So, but yeah, so basically, I, I think to answer your question, we're doing a lot of force measurement, a lot of acceleration measurement, modeling, and then in the vacuum, in, in the actual TVAC, we also have um, instrumentation to measure that jitter right at the uh, uh, pretend. Um, tech. All right, yeah, I can see that being pretty important, especially for the electrical optical applications. Uh, so being that it's an active system, what magnitude, what, how are you doing the, how are you targeting the reliability? Uh, for, you know, targeting one of your mission, more? Uh, We're really looking for two-year missions. Um, so the, the two systems on here that are gonna be active, um, well, three would actually be the, the, the micro pump that drives the fluid loop. And we have a we have a company out in England that, that provides those, and they 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 quote about a two to two to three year life expectancy. We actually uh, contacted them and got extra long life versions. Um, we the crowd coolers are standard Recore K508Ns. Those have, those have been proven and flight worthy for a variety of missions already, and they they last about two years plus. And then the last one is stepper is the stepper motor that controls the orientation of the radiator, and um, once again, so I guess it gets to answer your question. What we're basically doing is is specifically purchasing all cost parts that have life expectancies over two years. Quick question. For and then yes. Sorry. Um, for a lot of CubeSat missions and low Earth orbit missions, um, they go off of um, the space station, and they have all sorts of safety requirements on. Um, pressurized drain closed yeah. vessels and housing. How, are you planning to just not not fly through that path and just go up on um, other flights, or are you, do you have a path through NASA safety? So the so short answer to that one is it kind of depends on which which working fluid we're using. So for instance, we we traditionally use a very low viscosity fluid called Novex 7000 that um, is great because it's easy to pump in uh, in its very small channels. However, the one problem you get into is it can cavitate. Um, so you, like you said, you need to pressurize it. We pressurize, I've noticed that NASA gets really finicky over things over 100 PSI. So we aim for about 50 to 60 to 70 PSI. We just switched up the pump on this one from a rotary vane to a micro geared pump and switched the working fluid to more of an alcohol slurry. Um, and that means we can actually go pretty much at um, almost no pressurization if we need to. So we haven't really worked through that path yet, um, but we kind of have that 100 PSI as our, as our danger zone, don't go above that. And as far as going below that, I think we can work, um, depending on once again, the temperature ranges and the working fluid, we can work anywhere around very, very little pressurization all the way up to the highest we ever went was 75 PSI. And we also have an onboard accumulator and um, so there's like a res reservoir with, you know, like a, a bellow system in there to, to soak up pressure and, and whatnot. So 
like I said, we haven't fully worked through that 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 um that those worries yet. But yeah. Great, thanks. That's great. Thank you, Lucas. Uh, and so now I'd like to move to our fourth speaker, uh, Michael Smat, for, you know, talking about cellular-based aggregated satellite systems, the design and architecture of a three degree of freedom near frictionless test bed for ground validation of CubeSat operations. So uh, welcome, Michael. Hi, thanks, Alex. And yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. So thanks, thanks everybody for being here. Uh, my name is Michael Smat. I'm an undergraduate researcher at the University of Southern California's Information Sciences Institute and Space Engineering Research Center. And uh, my presentation was over the design and architecture of a three degree of freedom near frictionless ground testing platform for the validation of small set operations. And specifically it's used with uh, CBAS, uh, which is one of CERC's projects, which stands for a cellular based aggregated satellite system. Uh, so this ground testing platform is a crucial piece of hardware, especially at CERC, uh, because it allows, uh, because of its ability to test and validate uh, rendezvous and proximity operations and docking procedures uh, for different small sat concepts. Um, and it's able to do so uh, without the use of computationally intensive or complex simulations. Uh, previously, there have been a number of research groups that have done similar things with similar goals. And so this vehicle that we developed at CERC, uh, which I'll be referring to as uh, Generation 2 or Gen 2, um, I also refer to it as, as this in the presentation in the paper. Uh, but Gen 2 was designed with an eye towards being able to produce uh, reliable and reproducible testing results at the lowest amount of cost, uh, the easiest way to manufacture, and by using the least amount of physical space. Uh, so the, the closest relative to generation two is uh, most likely the, the microsatellite uh, dynamic test facility, uh, which led to generation one. And uh, I, I definitely go into this a little bit more in the paper, but generation one was developed um, mainly to support the research that was going into the CBAS project that was mentioned earlier. Uh, generation one, while functional, was, was a, a bit unreliable in its testing. And this is mainly due to the fact that it tried to incorporate all of its different systems into one level. Uh, and so generation two was designed with an eye towards uh, making the testing easier to perform and uh, more, more iterative in nature uh, without potentially disrupting any of the systems on the vehicle. And the systems which I'm referring to are the pneumatic system, which provide propulsion and flotation, uh, the electronic subsystem, and the payload subsystem, which is specific to whatever project it's currently being used for. Uh, so generation two is about nine inches in diameter by 20 inches in height, which means that it's not only space efficient and mass efficient, uh, but it's also easy to modify while testing. Um, it's entirely self-sufficient. Uh, it, houses, it houses its own power supply, controllers, sensors, and propulsion and flotation systems. Uh, propulsion is achieved via eight on-off solenoid valves, which are situated around the vehicle. And flotation is achieved via three air bearing discs, which are positioned on the bottom of the vehicle. And both of these pneumatic systems are uh, fed by a cold gas air supply, uh, which is fed by a, a common source, which is withheld within a uh, composite overwrapped uh, pressure vessel, uh, which is held in the center of the vehicle. Uh, currently, CERC has already manufactured one of these ground testing platforms, and uh, we're hoping to be able to use it on a number of projects in this upcoming year, or potentially even next year. Uh, some of these projects include CBAS, uh, which, which was explained earlier, um, REACH, which is utilizing a reactive electroadhesion cloth capture, uh, which is a, a concept which is aiming to potentially uh, mitigate uh, orbital debris while in orbit. Um, additionally, CLING, which is a genderless electromechanical docking mechanism, and RPO Swarm, uh, which is exploring the ability for large swarms of spacecraft to be able to cooperate in close proximity to each other once in orbit. Um, which involves algorithms a, a, a bit more complex than um, simply flying in, uh, flying in formation once in orbit. That's great. Thanks, Michael. So I guess the question I had was, you know, this is ground-based, right? And so the frictionless test bed. How responsive would you say this generation two is to, let's say, dynamic unintended inputs? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, that's definitely one of the things that we were aiming to combat with this second generation. Um, the first generation was, was certainly uh, a little bit more susceptible to those kinds of fluctuations. Um, but in, in terms of uh, where the sources of those coming from, that, that's mainly due to the propulsion and flotation systems. Um, from the flotation system, at least, using the air bearing disks, uh, we, we were able to 
we, we were able to produce tests that mitigated those kinds of fluctuations that you mentioned um, because the air bearing discs that are used use a, a porous media technology uh, so that you're only able to pressure, you, you only pressurize them to their, um, the standard amount that they're set to. And then they're able to control any of the fluctuations that might arise from um, anything such as a, a pressure spike in the, in the cold gas system. Um, and then additionally with the propulsion system, I, I think uh, the most susceptible would be the case that there are the on-off solenoid valves. Um, if you're firing multiple in, in, in one situation or if you need to go in a specific direction that requires multiple of the valves to be firing at one um, time, then it's definitely, it, it definitely could uh, uh, lead, lead to those kind of fluctuations, uh, which is one of our points for further research is to be able to use a, um, a propulsion system that allows variable thrust control uh, through all of the thrusters. Great. What, what about external inputs? Uh, say you, you've built one, but you start, you build a handful and then you have them uh, demonstrating a swarm type capability, uh, RPO of some sort, and the algorithms aren't quite adjusted and they start bumping into each other. How, how responsive is the system to that? Uh, we actually haven't tested that yet. Um, as, as I mentioned before, we, we've only had the chance to manufacture one of these systems so far. Um, and so while, while we've been able to test uh, how it reacts by itself on the, the optic table uh, on which it floats, we haven't been able to see how it reacts to the um, external fluctuations like you, like you mentioned. But that, that, that will be an interesting thing that we'll have to work around once it gets to that phase of testing. Awesome. And then as far as the decision when you built this, uh, one of the questions came on here says, um, is not F, would an FPGA be more efficient than a GPU, knowing that it's also radiation hardened? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and and that's, that's one of the things uh, uh, that, that is mentioned in the paper and, and talked a little bit more in the presentation, but the, the, the base vehicle uh, that's proposed is, is made entirely uh, with commercial off-the-shelf products. Um, so so an, an, another point that, that's typically raised is, is wouldn't a, um, a PCB more efficient, be more efficient and um, better than potentially using uh, the Arduinos and the, the Raspberry Pi that we're currently using? Um, and it's definitely true, and, and, and it's something that is a uh, decision that's made project by project. Uh, so that uh, currently with, with all of the hardware that's on the vehicle, uh, it's, it's able to operate and it's, it's able to produce reliable results. Um, but in terms of uh, modifying it to be able to be better suited for different projects and their specific needs, um, those kinds of modifications could definitely be made. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that comment. There's always a lot of desire to optimize, but then when you're doing academic research, you have a lot of student team turnover and having something in there that everybody can program right away um, and use and then optimize maybe in a second stage makes a lot of sense. Is that what you were thinking when you were going through the design decisions? Yeah, 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 exactly. No, that's great. Yeah, you know, that's, I think you, you hit on the head and it seems like a very versatile system that you're putting in place. And so, no, I definitely appreciate that. And so do you see, as you're building this generation two, um, and what you've learned, what would inform you for a generation three? Uh, I'd say like a two Bravo or Right. Yeah. Yeah. The na naming convention definitely has a, a little bit of flexibility. Um, but in, in terms of the ground testing platform itself, uh, I definitely say, as, as, as Carrie, you mentioned, pushing it to testing quicker um, rather, rather than spending more of the time in, in the design phase and the, the simulating phase, um, especially with these kinds of platforms where once you get to the testing phase, uh, you start to realize a lot of the problems that you wouldn't have otherwise realized. Um, I I'd, I'd definitely recommend pushing it to the testing phase sooner and, and realizing that um, the iterating, in order for it to be the most efficient path to the final product, um, iterating should happen as, as soon as possible. That's awesome. With the, with the build you have, what, uh, how do you determine, uh, or are you able to determine the accuracy of each of your planned, you know, uh, solenoid jet firings? Is yeah, so, adjustable? Right, yeah. So, so as, as mentioned, it was, they're all on-off solenoid valves, uh, so the uh, variable thrust isn't a feature yet on the vehicle. Um, we're, we're hoping to be able to implement, at, implement that at some point in the future. Um, but in, in terms of the effects of, of multiple firings at once and accounting for that pressure loss, um, that's been something that uh, we will we'll be looking more into once we're able to build uh, multiple of these vehicles and see how they're interacting with one another. Um, 
we've taken a, a few measures with this generation two vehicle to ensure that the pressure drop is is mitigated uh, so some of the things like making sure that um, lines going to each of the solenoid valves aren't coming from a single supply uh, splitting them into two different manifolds so that um, half of the the thrusters on one half of the vehicle and the other half are separated from one another so that firings on the other sides are a little bit less affected than if they were coming from all coming from a single uh, common supply um, but as, as far as uh, quantifying quantifying those effects and seeing how they affect testing um, again that's that's something that we'll we'll have to see and, and really uh, determine how big of an issue it might be in testing and getting reliable results uh, once we've manufactured a few of them and, and put them into testing on the table. That's great. That's awesome. Sounds like it's going to be a really cool tool. Well, thank you, Michael. I appreciate that. And now I'd like to move to our, our last speaker, uh, Afreen Siddiqui. Uh, her talk is an integrating globally dispersed calibration and small satellite mission value. All right, Afreen? great. Uh, thank you, Welcome. thank you, Alex, uh, uh, for this. Um, so you've already mentioned the title. So I will mention that uh, we've done this work uh, with colleagues here at MIT, Professor Olivier Devec and, and Sheila Barber, and with their partners at LabSphere, Dr. Chris Durrell, Dr. Brandon Russell, and Dr. Jeff Fold. Um, and our work has been driven by the context uh, in which we've, you know, observing that small satellites are providing growing amounts of Earth observation data. They are, you know, they have passed the realm of just technology demonstration and testing, and many of them are now providing data that uh, several, you know, uh, Earth scientists and uh, people studying geophysical phenomena are interested in using uh, that data from small satellites. But if we are to use those applications, then the accuracy and high quality becomes an important issue um, of, of the data that is, uh, that is obtained. Now, in case of large spacecraft that have traditionally provided Earth, Earth observation data, which has been used uh, for Earth science, for weather, and many other applications, uh, the data is uh, of high quality, high accuracy. There are onboard calibration equipment on large spacecraft uh, that perform periodic calibrations and so forth. Uh, this type of equipment is not present on small spacecraft uh, because of size and cost limitations. Uh, in many cases, uh, small spacecraft are doing um, um, bas basically making use of pseudo invariant calibration sites in the Sahara Desert. Uh, in some cases, uh, they're using intercalibration with larger spacecraft, uh, Landsat, and so forth. Uh, but overall, there is a need uh, for improving both uh, the calibration frequency and opportunities uh, that small spacecraft can use and, uh, and essentially you know, improve their, their data quality and data products. Uh, more importantly, uh, what we've also identified in related research is that you know, calibration is important uh, because it improves you know, level one data products. And as those data products are uh, you know, sort of uh, further processed and higher level data products are used, uh, small calibration errors can actually get magnified and result in to larger errors uh, into level two, three, four uh, data products and so forth. So calibration accuracy uh, is of great interest and importance. Um, and it's going to be very important if small satellites can use globally dispersed calibration sites uh, for enhancing the overall mission value. So what we've done in this work is to develop an approach uh, for systematically analyzing, uh, valuing, and integrating uh, the presence of ground-based calibration sites on small satellite mission design and operation planning. Uh, this is a method that can be used uh, in sort of a quantitative way for trade studies. And what we use is essentially a proxy metric of value, which we call effective data acquired uh, to quantify the overall mission, overall you know, value returned by a mission. Uh, the effective data acquired is a metric uh, in which we incorporate the quantity of data acquired uh, by different spacecraft in the mission, as well as quality of data acquired. Um, the quality metric for imaging sensors, uh, is, in our case, uh, we use signal to noise ratio as, as a quality metric. Uh, and it helps, you know, sort of uh, incorporate a lot of uh, parameters related to the mission design, uh, spacecraft instrument, as well as the orbital parameters. So we use the single noise ratio, the quality metric, and the data quantity is based on, uh, you know, the data rates, uh, the amount of images taken, the revisit frequency, and so forth. 
Uh, so all of this is combined in this EDA. Uh, and then what we further do is that we use a discounting factor, which captures the time-based degradation of imaging sensors and calibration frequency of sensors during emission. So this allows us to sort of, um, in a systematic and quantitative and traceable way, account for both the mission design as well as calibration sites and calibration frequency uh, that may be used in a mission and overall get a sense of mission value. Now this discounting factor that I just mentioned um, is basically analogous to what is used in financial valuation, uh, you know, where time-based uh, uh, value of money uh, is a well-known concept and, you know, discount rates uh, that, are, that capture time value of money, as well as any risks that may be associated with investments uh, uh, are also used uh, for discounting uh, the value of money. And, you know, you may have heard of, you know, risk-adjusted discounting factors uh, that are used in, in val evaluating, you know, sort of, uh, uh, returns from services or projects, we use those concepts and we sort of apply them in our case to evaluate uh, space mission value. So that's where, you know, sort of our method comes from. Uh, and it can be used in a relative way for, for comparing, you know, different missions and different uh, cases for trade studies. So in the paper, we run some uh, proof of concept studies uh, using some simple simulations. Uh, we haven't accounted for detailed costs and we haven't monetized uh, the data returned from any particular mission. We just use uh, sort of, you know, uh, effective data acquired uh, as a basis, uh, as a proxy value. Uh, in, in, our, in our simulations and in some, you know, cases that we run, uh, in some cases, you know, we did a constellation of four CubeSats uh, doing global observation and we sort of, you know, sort of um, simulate uh, various degradation rates and then quantify what the impact on effective data acquired is and then use the difference between cases where calibration is performed versus when it is not performed as a means of quantifying what the difference of calibration makes in overall mission value. Uh, so certain cases that we've done in the paper, we find that, you know, for a 2.5% degradation rate, there can be up to a 60% difference uh, in effective data acquired uh, in a 90-day mission where calibration is or is not done on a weekly basis and so on and so forth. So overall, uh, our work essentially offers a methodology that can be used in pre-phase A trade studies uh, for guiding mission design as well as operation planning in which uh, both the in-space segment, spacecraft, if you will, and ground segments, which, you know, ground-based calibration sites are sim simultaneously considered uh, and evaluated. Um, so so I, I would encourage you to read the paper for more details, but that's sort of the overall uh, overview of our work. I definitely appreciate that, Afrin, and I appreciate the way you thought about this. I guess the first question that I have is, is the um, EDA and your discount factor a way of normalizing across the different sensors in a given constellation? or even across different constellations. So you have just many different sensors and how do you normalize them? So, you know, time, uh, meteorological and so forth. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so one thing uh, that I do want to clarify is that, you know, this is really meant for a particular constellation or a particular, you know, sort of mission design where, you know, you can hold certain things constant. It will get very tricky very quickly if you start comparing, you know, apples to oranges or you start considering, you know, different missions that are doing completely different things. So one is doing weather, the other is doing, let's say, you know, uh, snow and ice cover or, you know, what, what have you. Uh, it's really meant for uh, guiding for a particular application and a particular mission can be compare you know, in a relative way what the difference in value would be the way we are defining value uh, in this case uh, and having a quanti quantitative basis of doing that. So that's really, so that's, that's the first thing. Um, second thing is that, you know, for the um, uh, time-based, you know, valuation, um, again, it has to be sort of thought carefully through and empirically derived as well. So in our paper, what we're doing is we're essentially using sort of a, 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 a sort of a simple linear degradation model in which we're assuming that, you know, the accuracy of the data is just sort of declining over time consistently and continuously until the sensor is again recalibrated. Uh, that needs to be further improved. Uh, this is sort of, you know, a first order model that we're using, uh, but one that we think, you know, is, is reasonable first, uh, first attempt. 
Uh, and, you know, sort of the parameterization of that model requires some empirical data. Now, you know, the degradation, sensor degradation uh, is sort of quantified for some of the large spacecraft. So for, you know, the OLI instrument on Landsat, you know, they've quantified there's a 0.2%, you know, degradation in the coastal aerosol, you know, blue band per year. Uh, you know, this is sort of, you know, quantified. Now, they also routinely, you know, sort of uh, recalibrate and adjust this accordingly when, when they're... Uh, uh, deriving their higher data products. Uh, we don't have such characterization for small spacecraft as of yet. Um, and, you know, we would need empirical data to really start getting a sense of really what and at uh, what level of degradations uh, can one reasonably assume uh, and where does it really make sense for what kinds of mission. Uh, certainly, you know, their impacts start accruing over time. Uh, so very short-lived missions, uh, we're looking at a very different case versus longer-lived missions and so on. Um, so there are many different, I guess, aspects that go into defining the discounted uh, discount factor, which is a function of time. Uh, but but there are you know these are these are the key things that we hope to sort of uh, you know delve into. I, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> no, absolutely, absolutely, that's great. And then I guess the question follow on would be: Did you use all empirical data, or did you have to uh, estimate degradation values for certain sensors in your models? And then, yeah. how, if you had to estimate, how did you come around with those rates? Yeah, no, so so that's exactly exactly right. So we we've only used you know sort of uh, notional data as of yet. Uh, we have we don't as I, as I mentioned we don't have empirical data to go with right yeah. now. The the large spacecraft can give us some bounding values, as I said. You know the OLI instrument on Landsat, right? Uh, they can provide us some notion. Uh, but, you know, uh, those instruments are very, very different. So, uh, you know, we're, we're certainly not making any claims that we can use OLI as a basis uh, for, you know, validating our, our model. What we would need is, uh, you know, great, greater characterization of the actual sensors that are being used on the small spacecraft and so forth. Um, so, so far, what we've done is sort of show a proof of concept study and show a methodology. The actual numerical values of the parameters, uh, you know, is future work. <laughs> Seems, yeah, seems like it'd be really interesting. Well, that's great. Uh, um, so I know I'm looking at the time. Want to be aware that um, it's uh, we have about eight minutes remaining in the session. So uh, I'd like to open it up to the many attendees. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please put them in the chat, the, the Q and A app. Uh, I, the sp our speaker Martina, um, she she had to step off for uh, another engagement that begins and shortly. So uh, if you have questions for Martina about the, the deep learning, accelerated deep learning, please engage with her. Uh, her email address is in her paper. Um, and uh, she put a message here in, in the chat as well. Uh, so I guess with that, so I guess any questions uh, open up to the, the entire panel and um, they can be general questions that apply to everyone or uh, very specific questions. And give, a, give a minute here for anyone to, and I mentioned again, uh, yeah, all the papers can be found online at the uh, online proceedings in the uh, on the website. All right. So. Okay. Okay. So I guess then um, I have a question then after for another follow on here is with the ground sites that they would qualify or use as their, their standard, would, would you, how, I guess I'm trying to think about, it. how would you require a different standard for each sensor type or mission type? And then would that require then to the capitalization to put in that ground, you know, standard sensor, or is it, is there a more ubiquitous way of doing that? Uh, somehow normalizing BRDF or something like that. Yeah, so, you know, I mean, in our case, what we've done so far is taken a very simple approach, at least in the paper that we used, that we just essentially looked at revisit frequency. Uh, and we looked at revisit frequency at two levels. One at, let's say, you know, the constellation level, as well as, you know, spacecraft level. Ideally, if you want to look at, you know, sensors within particular spacecraft, you want to make sure that you look at spacecraft level revisit frequency uh, for a particular, you know, uh, mission. And what we assumed was that, uh, you know, we essentially took uh, some simplifying assumptions and we assumed that, you know, uh, the higher we visit frequency you have of a particular region that becomes a promising calibration site uh, because, you know, it gives you more opportunities for, for calibration. 
uh, and then we assume that you know there's no cloud cover, there are no other you know sort of geophysical features that in in reality need to be considered depending on what it is that you're trying to measure, right? Sometimes you we have you know a, a high dynamic range of your instrument, you're trying you have several bands, and you know you have different calibration needs depending on on you know the particular mission and instrument you're dealing with. We've neglected all of those. Uh, all of these things actually need to be packed in in reality when you start identifying you know useful calibration sites. Uh, so our basis so far has just been uh, been sort of a gross, I guess, first order measure of free visit frequency, which gives you a sense of, you know, how frequently you'll get the opportunity of calibrating your spacecraft uh, if it's revisiting that site, which has been instrumented uh, with calibration um, uh, equipment. Uh, now, as I mentioned, uh, going beyond just the spacecraft, you know, you can consider a constellation level uh, revisit mm -hmm. as well, where, you know, different spacecraft from that are part of the constellation are visiting that site. Uh, and that can also be very useful where you're trying to eventually produce data products that are at the constellation level. And ex example is, you know, Planet, which produces, you know, mosaic uh, data, right? So they're actually aggregating images taken by different spacecraft. And then, you know, each, uh, each particular image uh, may have different, you know, portions uh, that have been acquired perhaps by different spacecraft and so on and so forth. Uh, in that case, you know, uh, constellation level calibration becomes very important. Uh, and, you know, our, our tool will allow us to do that as well. Uh, but as I mentioned, you know, uh, in our case so far, we've only used revisit frequency as the first, you know, sort of uh, parameter. Uh, to, to select basically calibration sites um, on, uh, on, on, on the ground. We just used uh, sort of one feature, one constraint that they need to be below, you know, the Arctic Circle, just for logistic reasons. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, there can, be, there can be many other constraints that can be built in. Um, the, the nice, I guess, uh, you know, um, sort of approach that our method offers is that, you know, we, we use this metric, uh, you know, this quantification of effective data acquired by essentially running, you know, uh, simulations, orbital simulations of a, of a, of a, of a, of a mission. Um, and depending on, you know, the fidelity of simulations and the model of your instrument, uh, you know, you can get a lot of information on what could be useful calibration sites. Um, in our case, we just did very simple, uh, you know, first order estimations uh, uh, to show proof of concept, as I mentioned. That's awesome. That really is. I, I, now, I had another question. Um, can or this one came online? Can these calibrations be applied to future interplanetary missions when it comes to imaging and the process of raw data? Uh, so for interplanetary missions, you know, we're talking about a different thing altogether now, right? Uh, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the way we are uh, talking about this particular methodology, it is for designing Earth observation missions and a particular mission, so not you know different missions and so forth, but in general. Uh, you know, the process of calibration is, is, is you know, is, is at a very high level. It's all about making sure that you understand what your sensors are doing and you understand your sensors performance. Um, so, of course, you know, you use different types of methodologies, you use different objects uh, for calibrating your, your sensors uh, for different types of, uh, you know, interplanetary missions. We haven't considered that uh, in our study yet. Great. I imagine it'd be hard to get a significant revisit with interplanetary. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Depends on your constellation and your ground contacts. So. Sure. Uh, interesting question would be, um, given the variety and density of planetary atmospheres, how do you do drag on other planets, are you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So no, I think even drag on other planets are, are very low. <laughs> um, but even even on low Earth orbit, um, the, the drag sails aren't really effective above around 800 kilometers. Um, so it's, it's, yeah, <laughs> it's something that we have to take into account. And uh, solar radiation pressure do, does kick in um, at that height, um, but yeah, drag isn't very large. Very good consideration. Yeah, <laughs> good to know that. So, well, um, I know we're coming up here right on an hour. I um, want to thank every, uh, all the speakers and all the time, and all the great questions. And uh, thank you, Carrie, if um, you have any parting words. I just would like to give a warm round of applause. Thank you again to all of the panelists, not only for your great work writing all the papers, making all the presentations, putting them online, and then spending the time with us, um, giving us a live synopsis and answering questions. And so thank you everyone for the terrific work. And thank you, Alex, once again, for um, masterful
moderating of the session and um, handling everyone. So um, thanks again and I'm looking forward to seeing everyone next year.